This is the, the, the Analysis in Chains with Nathan Williams and Neil Kieran. <laughs> Welcome to Analysis in Chains. I'm Nathan Williams, and joining me today is Phil Zamani, the CEO of the Ergo Foundation. Phil, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Nathan. So the Ergo Foundation is uh, what you call a fourth-generation blockchain. It's a base layer protocol, as far as I understand it, which means it's got its own blockchain. They're running on, its, uh, running on people's own computers, their own nodes. And it aims to be a system that allows companies to sort of integrate between each other, have a, um, an interface between private blockchains and public blockchains and make use of side chains to increase scalability. Is that a good way of describing it? Very good way. So tell me a little bit about the project. Sure, sure. So firstly, uh, Nathan, the team behind Ergo is actually based, primarily based here in Seoul, Korea, South Korea. It's a company called Blocko. Uh, probably after IBM has the most in production deployed blockchains in use with enterprises. In, in, at last count, 23 customers, 24 projects. They are all permission-based blockchains. So Block over the last four years has been working with a hybrid blockchain based on the Bitcoin protocol and the Ethereum JVM and their own technology to implement various use cases for clients in Korea, banks, the government, um, the, the uh, central stock exchange and a number of manufacturing companies. So companies like Samsung, Hyundai, Kia, Shinhan Motors and Lotte Card. So what they've done is implemented blockchain for clients. That technology has actually allowed us to test out various techniques and we believe that the future of distributed systems mainly for businesses will entail a hybrid of public and private blockchains uh, namely side chains on the one hand you need the trust of a public chain but you need the scalability and the governance and control you get from permission blockchains but you need to mix the two technologies together so it's actually a hybrid blockchain platform mm -hmm. So when you say side chains, you know, this is, uh, this is something that you'll see in a lot of modern projects, but uh, I think it's still sort of a new concept for a lot of people, especially people who are just getting into blockchain or people who are buying tokens, that sort of thing. Uh, when you say side chain, what exactly does that mean? Think of two different chains sitting side by side. Let's assume on one side you have a private chain that is running fast, high speed, because it's running on a high performance network, either within the company or by a telco. And on the left, you have a public chain that runs slow, but provides ultimate trust. A side chain is a way by which you can combine the two technologies and allow data transactions to be validated on both chains. So in effect, it duplicates transactions to give you best, the best of both worlds. Now, when you made your decision to do a delegated proof of stake, uh, as we all know, for the base layer protocols, there, there's a big <laughs> uh, argument uh, within them uh, over which protocol and consensus algorithm specifically uh, is the best one is going to win. But ultimately, I think that it's all about trade-offs. And when you were making your decision to go away from proof of work into delegated proof of stake, as a what why did you choose that as opposed to some of the others such as uh proof of importance or uh or, or, or uh, dbft or any of the others sure sure as you say there's a compromise with with, with with whichever choice you make we have found the depos is the one that seems to give you the maximum uh transaction throughput in a hybrid architecture we've actually tested this as i said with over 24 clients there's at least 25 million uh nodes and when I mean those devices already in production in Korea with banks and other companies where we've tested this out, we feel it's the best balance of highest transaction throughput and safety in terms of uh, the way we send the block producers. There are many alternatives here. The difference between what we're doing and many others, many others are theoretical projects written in white papers. This has been developed over four years and tested and in production. So we feel that gives us some level of assurance. This is probably one of the better techniques to deploy. Now tell me, Phil, um, how did you get into blockchain at the beginning? 
You know, like uh, when you like, there's a lot in here that is definitely next generation tech that combines the the interface with uh, with enterprise software and big business. But it sounds to me like you've got a big business background. What appealed to you about blockchain? Sure. Well, it's actually exactly 20 years ago, Nathan. I was invited in as one of the early founding members of. Red Hat to establish their business credentials in Europe. So I actually ran the Red Hat business uh, in the first years. I then moved on to four other open source projects, Suzy, Novell, VMware, Tomcat, Apache, OpenStack. So I've had the benefit and the luck and the honor to work with some brilliant engineers and brilliant salespeople who over the last 20 years have helped transition enterprise customers away from proprietary solutions from companies like IBM, HP, EMC, VMware, and even some microsystems to open source technologies. So my background is open source. I've also had the benefit of building a cloud infrastructure for Deutsche Telekom, and I see blockchain as a similar kind of dynamic, very exciting technology, very disruptive. Me and my teams love doing new tech stuff. I've been thinking a lot, uh, Phil, recently about the development of the ecosystem as a whole. And <clears throat> with a lot of projects, they present themselves and design themselves as platforms. But because up until I would say the sp even spring, summer, um, it was easier to launch an ICO than to build on someone else's product, what people would do is create a, uh, a platform and then try and incentivize people to build on it. And that was their main challenge. Now that the Ethereum price has taken a bit of a hit, we're in you know fourth, uh, third quarter 2018, it's, uh, the, the market's a little soft, people seem to be adopting a wait and see attitude. And I'm wondering if, it, if you imagine it's going to be a continuing challenge to get people to build on your protocol yeah, that's a great question and uh, observation, Nathan. We are luckily not part of that. We are actually moving faster <laughs> than before, and I'll explain why. We do not rely on the Ethereum price. The company is well backed by our partnership with uh, Blocko. We have a strong balance sheet. We have a very large team. We are 86 people large, 55 developers. We're doubling every six months and we will be probably up to 200 people by the end of next year. So we're actually not holding back we are, going to, we are going to populate the first enterprise DApps for Ergo ourselves. We'll be launching yeah. some exciting products, and those will be coming out very fast, very quickly. These were not mentioned in any white paper, because we kept this undercover, but as an exclusive for you, Nathan, I can tell you and your, your listeners, watch this space. Whilst others are waiting for price fluctuation in cryptocurrencies, we are focused on two things, building the tech, building the team. Okay, cool. Uh, how do you incentivize companies and projects to build on your platform because i mean this is this is a huge challenge you know i mean e eos sure. and uh, sure. uh, you know others uh, others have been uh, creating sort of accelerator foundations you know give a half a million euros worth of tokens to do it well we will be following a similar pound but there's one big difference and i cannot disclose how we do it nathan this is our differentiation fair enough <laughs> but going back to what i said i have 20 years 25 years of launching new technologies like linux hadoop Tomcat, Spring Source, OpenStack uh, around the world, and we manage to attract very large customers, very large communities here. You do not do this by plowing money into, into accelerators. There are more accelerators now, uh, like FinTech Accelerator, there are users of the technology here. So there's something wrong there. Because of your extensive background in open source, open source has almost become a bit of a buzzword, right? Like everybody's a foundation. Everybody's nonprofit, everybody's open source, but not everybody really is, you know, like sometimes it's a convenient holding structure for doing a fundraise or uh, sure. what have you. And there are always trade-offs when you decide to make that decision. You know, you like you have open source and then suddenly you've got a flood of, uh, of developers that you've never met before uh, commenting on your project, putting up, uh, putting up commits. And um, what are some of the trade-offs that you've seen and how have you, managed to mitigate the challenge, given that this evolved out of a enterprise software approach. To do open source is quite difficult to do it well. The people talk about open source technology, open source core, open source uh, architectures. The truth is you need to be an open source platform. It's a way of life. It's a way of development. It's a methodology. It's a culture. 
And very few companies have managed to do that very well. There are literally hundreds of thousands of open source projects, yet there's only been seven successful ones, namely Linux, Hadoop, Spark, uh, Apache, uh, Tomcat, Spring Source, and OpenStack. The, the simple answer is, if you decide to do open source, you better do it 100% well. And that means you have to compromise on how you do this and take time. If you don't do it 100%, you may as well just not do it. Blockchain really got its start with a group of crypto anarchists, right? Uh, who, uh, who, who got together and found a way of delivering value without trusting a third party, you know, from making these transactions by keeping the ledger amongst themselves, hence the Bitcoin we all know and love. How much of that do you imagine is going to survive over the next 10 years? Do you think that we're going to see a reemergence of uh, sort of distributed power systems where individuals are coming together to make the uh, to make these platforms work, or do you imagine it being more and more concentrated into enterprise, with uh, with a few large players and corporate players dominating the blockchain scene? I think it will be the former, and again, to repeat myself. Uh, history doesn't repeat itself, it, it rhymes in tech. And the same thing could have happened with Linux. When Linux first came out, companies like Oracle and Red Hat, sorry, Oracle, Microsoft, and IBM tried to dominate the market, but Red Hat prevailed and so did other companies like Suzy. Once you decide to use open source as your core technology, it's almost impossible for an enterprise to dominate that market. This is why I believe many of the, uh, hi, uh, the consortium out there, like Hyperledger and others, I do not believe longer term they will survive. There will be a class of blockchains that will be used maybe for some banking ecosystems but uh, these banks are not software vendors you will always need a software cover that stands behind the code and provides enterprise support so i believe the future will always be enterprise software solutions that are developed around an open architecture where you have lots of developers contributing code but you have enterprises using the technology i do not believe it will go down the proprietary route well, I guess it remains to be seen. I'm, I don't know. I personally, I'm sort of of two minds about it. I could see it going either way. Once one thing I heard someone say once uh, that has stuck with me is that the challenge of blockchain is that the average person doesn't care about decentralization. They care about well-managed infrastructure and you know, uh, I think uh, it could go either way depending on which one the average person considers yeah. to be well managed. Yeah. But Nathan, if I can jump in there, just a last comment. People said exactly the same thing about Linux. Nobody cares about open source. Businesses don't care about uh, the cathedral and the bazaar. The article was written many years ago by Richard Stallman. They don't care about freedom of uh, licensing here. What they want is great tech to run their business. Yet today, Linux is still an open source project because if even though the customers may not appreciate why having an open architecture makes sense, the vendors that provide the solutions know there is no way for them to develop technology like this unless they have an open source technology base. Mm. So it's not so much what the customers think, it's actually what the ecosystem needs. I have a question. It's about the nature of infrastructure. Now, to give you a context, I've had a lot of conversations in the past little while about companies wanting to adopt blockchain but separate themselves from cryptocurrency and sort of divorce the two, mostly because of the hype last year, the prevalence of scams. Cool. Um, but my view has been up until this point that blockchain really offers an opportunity for a different way of paying for infrastructure in a decentralized manner. And what I mean by that is like if you have types of infrastructure like roads, well, they can be paid for by government or phone lines, they can be paid for by private industry, but heavily, heavily regulated. And when the internet came, you had infrastructure such as uh, you know, Google or Facebook, where they were paid for by people selling your data. And obviously, that's unpleasant. So yeah. with blockchain, the, the ability to create assets means that you can have decentralized infrastructure without someone in the middle uh, that essentially pays for itself through use. Now, I guess the question I have is, do you see cryptocurrency as sort of central to the development of this next generation of infrastructure? Or are you seeing that uh, there is a need to separate the blockchain from cryptocurrency? And if so, how would the infrastructure work in the future? The prevalence of cryptocurrency and, to, and the attraction of... Uh, 
in effect crowd source and crowdfunding project has been great for the last few years there's been obviously lots of money plowed into op to open architecture like bitcoin and other protocols so that is the lure of a cryptocurrency has attracted many people to invest in this technology and without that investment you would not attract great companies and great developers here if you remove the cryptocurrencies the coins from the equation there'll be a lack of investment which means the technology won't develop the question is can you use the cryptocurrencies to spark or initiate or incubate the projects and then move to a normal model? A normal model is customers just to want to solve problems with blockchains. So I believe we will see a migration from the current, uh, if you like, uh, hype around ICOs and raising lots of funding towards in raising enough funding to get the project off the ground. But the, the project needs to survive like many other projects do in the future, which is around uh, getting customers using the technology and paying for the service in whatever currency they want, whether it's fiat, dollars, won, or uh, rimney. I think uh, there will be a need for currencies to attract investment. But whether that currency is what's used to run the architecture is a separate story. That's why there's a lot of work going on into the so-called token economics. Why is a coin or a, a unit of currency needed for the end user? Not many companies have an answer to that question. We are trying to answer that question ourselves. In our case, just as you indicated, you will be using the Ergo token to buy services from cloud providers, telco providers that may be running the blocks for your specific instance of your blockchain. But I think it's nobody's figured out how you can separate the two, because if you separate the two, you won't have a blockchain industry, I think. I think I would agree with that. And on that note, we should wrap up. Thank you very much. So uh, Phil Zamani, the CEO of Ergo, and uh, the co-founder and uh, co-CEO of Blocko, uh, they are based in Hong Kong. They are doing a fourth generation first layer blockchain protocol platform that is going to be open source, including DPOS. And you can find out more at ergo.io and that will be in the liner notes. Thank you very much, Phil, for joining me today. Thank you, Nathan. It's a pleasure. Thank <laughs> you.